Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of The Cup, brought to you by Cup of Hemlock Theater. I am your panel host, once again, Mackenzie, also general assistant of Cup of Hemlock for the time being. Uh, so we are doing today uh, John Caird's production of Love's Labor Lost, which is a very kind of not done very often comedy of the Shakespeare canon. Uh, but they we're going to talk about it today and kind of get into what it's all about. Joining me as always is our literary manager, uh, Ryan Barakovich. Ryan, welcome back for another episode. Always a pleasure. Yes. What is in your cup today? Uh, so in my cup, same as always, is Orange Pico Tea. Oh. But I have a more interesting looking mug today. Uh, this Ooh. So friends would know that I'm a big Monty Python fan. And this mm -hmm. mug has a lot of just various Monty Python quotes. I don't know how uh, well you yeah, can there see we it go. in the yes. camera there. And yes. some of the Terry Gilliam illustrations all over. So yeah, Beautiful. I thought it was fitting for a comedy that we were doing today. I think that is quite fitting. That is wonderful. Uh, we next have our friend of the company, and I have to say, I probably our most frequent guest of, of the series so far, Ms. Jill. Jill, welcome back. Hello, Mackenzie. How are you? Very good. Very good. good. What is in your cup today? And what is your ensemble? Right. I have to, I, that is now my brand, toe. I guess. Um, so, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I'm wearing a bit of a frou frou French esque inspired top, which okay. we'll get into later. Um, and then my earrings, they have little feathers tacked on at the bottom, you know, just to Very pay good. homage to all the quills and the lovely writing that we see in this piece. And then wow. in my cup, I have some tea tonight from David's Ooh. Tea. It's their sweetheart tea that uh, was really popular around Valentine's Day and it tastes exactly like sweet tart so it tastes delicious and again paying homage to all the love that we witnessed in this production. Very good and we have a new wonderful guest another friend of the company as well as one of our frequent contributors to our play book club Miss Katie. Katie hello. Hi <laughs> thanks so much for having me. Thank you for coming on this will be your yeah. first appearance but there will be others coming down the road on this series. So we're so happy that you yeah. came to join us for this one. This is quite a treat. Thanks. Yeah, I'm, I'm so excited. I'm so honored mm -hmm. that y'all asked me to be here. So yeah, this is great. <laughs> Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Now, now, Kate, what's your background on Shakespeare? So, 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 you I, didn't I ask what's in her cup first, Meg. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's true. You're Sorry. slipping. I, I, I know. I've been drinking already. Uh, but yes, Kate, okay. what is in your cup? And then tell us a little bit about your Shakespeare background. Sure, it looks like water, but it's a uh, it's a, a pineapple neutral. I've been Ooh. really into neutrals this summer, so yeah, like a little a little flavored vodka soda. Love nice. that. Yeah, I yeah like so that's that. what I'm that's what I'm into. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, and then. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm an actor. Um, I went to school for musical theater, but in a program that was like very heavily based in, in acting and Stanislavski mm -hmm. and kind of those methods. So we, mm -hmm. we, Shakespeare was a big part of my, uh, of my education. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and always been kind of a, I've, I've rarely had the opportunity to like perform in Shakespeare um, because I mostly do kind of musical theater stuff, if you couldn't tell from the everything about me. <laughs> 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 but, but, um, but yeah, just like a, an avid avid fan i love shakespeare mm -hmm. i love kind of like yeah diving into the text and uh yeah kind of getting in getting into it so yeah very well exciting. fantastic well we can't wait to yeah. hear your thoughts on this play so yeah, why don't we kick this off uh with Heck, what's in your cup yeah oh, ah. good uh, it has it hasn't changed in every production we've done except for macros when i changed the cup right. because there is a special reason but normally as always it's my silver tankard of water love that Oh, yes. <laughs> exactly. So water and I, we go well together. Is it water or does it look like water? <laughs> it is water. It is water. I got my father's jeans for drinking, meaning I don't drink. <laughs> okay. Nearly anything. <laughs> uh, but there we go. But yes, we're going to talk about Love's Labors. Once again, as, once again, as we said, directed by John Caird, who for my musical theater fans, if you don't know, he is the co-director of the original production of Les Miserables. Oh, yeah, no, I didn't know, know that. that. Yes, you know what? It makes sense, though. He has the charisma to be on a team yes. of Les Mis wonderful yeah. And he's very good yeah. with ensemble casts, as yes. I think this production shows. Yes, yes, yes. He's yeah. very good with the ensemble cast. He, he is a member of the RSC, which is the Royal Shakespeare Company over in London with Trevor Nunn. Uh, they've directed a number of shows over there. 
Uh, and then this was his first time coming over to Stratford. So he is a wonderful director and this is his production of Love's Labor's Lost. So Katie, why don't you start us off tonight with who do you feel was the best performed character of the night? Okay, I have two. I have a couple. Okay. So um, two that like kind of really stood out for me were, well, A, probably my main answer to this question, Boyette. Mm, was yes. so great <laughs> oh yes. my gosh and like it's funny so I knew nothing about Love's Labor's Lost at all like mm -hmm. I'd never even I'd never read it I'd never mm -hmm. seen it and I I didn't kind of realize like I feel like this might be the play where like wordplay is the most prevalent it yeah, is absolutely. so so wordplay and uh yeah and I thought that Boyette did a really really good job of kind of like navigating that wordplay but also being very self-aware which is something that I kind of really appreciate in in Shakespeare is when people are kind of aware that the text is poetic and flowery and um very kind of metaphoric and uh mm -hmm. yeah and i thought i thought uh the actor so i don't know the actor's name which uh, I feel like john, was Boyette. john kirkpatrick was his name okay yeah, yeah. and he, i thought he was he was probably my favorite for sure with a close mm -hmm. second from from the woman who hmm. Rosalind. Yeah. oh yes Rosalind was sarah awful or yeah, Sarah but Ruby Offen. Joy was okay. also incredible. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. So, okay, so, that, so that, that was your first shout out, and you said you had mm -hmm. others. Uh, uh, oh, we, or you already said the two of them, right? Was, yeah, those um, are kind yeah. of my two biggest the ones. Two? Um, yeah, and then uh, yeah, and then obviously the princess Ruby Joy was yeah, yeah. truly phenomenal. Mm -hmm. Like such mm -hmm. a like an elegance and a grace and like mm -hmm. a a way of finding the, my kind of biggest pet peeve in Shakespeare is when the the speech sounds really pedantic. Yes. And I found that all of them, especially when people play royalty, it kind of it kind of tends to lend to that. And mm -hmm. I, I didn't think she did that at all. I thought it was like very kind of like natural and very yeah but still giving like the elegance mm -hmm. of like yeah she is royalty she's the princess so yeah very really like Ruby Joyce as well. yeah very good and her mm -hmm. father was the head coroner in um CSI New York Robert Joy oh oh cool Fun fact. Yeah. Yeah. yeah the two of them came to Barry my hometown to perform the Tempest one yeah. summer where cool. he played Prospero and she played um Miranda so there we go. Cool. And oh, actual nice. father daughter Tempest. Yeah, that's exactly. really cool. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it was a wonderful production. Uh, okay, Jill, who is your shout out of the day? Yeah, so um, ironically different folks than Katie Ooh. mentioned, but the same umbrella statement. Uh, I feel like everyone on stage, really, the flavor of the speech in their mouths were so enticing. Everyone sort of did their due diligence with yes. this um, very flowery mm -hmm. uh, linguistic piece. So um, mm -hmm. hats off to everyone. However, um, I have about, I have three, one for sure, close mm -hmm. second and then like an honorable mention so gotcha. um i believe i'm pronouncing this character correctly but costard our fool costard yeah yes. hands down in this series best fool we've seen to date because yes. i think it, he just he did so many different things he he owned the language mm -hmm. he made it traditional but also for a modern audience in the same sense and then he added his own characteristics and i i feel like again we can we can kind of um Cheers to uh, John. Is it Caird? Is that how you say his last name, Mac? Caird? John Caird? Oh. Our director, sorry. Oh, 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 yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah. John Caird, yeah. So um, in his pre-show speech of saying how, you know, the rehearsal process was all about, it's sort of like a chemical reaction of making the actor become mm -hmm. the character and the character become the actor. So I yes. saw that with a bunch of characters. Josu Labukin, I, if that's how you pronounce his name, that's the fellow who played Costard. He yeah. really hit that home for me. And every time his energy and presence was on stage. It just, I, I was totally enveloped with what was going on. Um, mm -hmm. Close second is good old Tom Rooney coming in with their <laughs> yes. holo, Holofernes. Holo, <laughs> Holofernes, yes. I think. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Again, I have not studied or, or read this Shakespeare either, so I'm writing down all the characters. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, in the best possible way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> So he, again, he, he, you could just tell too, his experience on the Shakespearean stage too, he just made it so flavorful to his own, mm -hmm. um, his own doing. And yeah. yeah, and then I also have to just give it up to Mike Shara as our Baron. Um, yeah. I actually did his whole speech on love, the one that he kind of just 
stands in the middle of the stage, delivers in act four, mm -hmm. I believe. Mm -hmm. um, I did that as just like a voice and text exercise. We had to choose a classical monologue. I did that in school oh. um, at U of T in Sheridan. And mm -hmm. it was interesting seeing it done in, in mm -hmm. the, the context of the play. And mm -hmm. I think he did such a good job and he did a really good job of balancing. He was talking about this in the pre-show chat too, of balancing, um, the sort of academia that the language presented, but then also keeping the comedy and silliness that his character kind of was mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and how that was challenging for him. And I, I think he kicked mm -hmm. it out of the park too. So first prize to Custard, second to Hellfernes or Hellferns and All third to Garone. <laughs> Very <laughs> good. Yeah. Very okay. good. And we will see Mike Shearer continue his uh, film journey in, when he appears in Hamlet as Laertes. So we will yeah. see him come back again. And he is a wonderful yeah. actor He's... who does both uh, Shakespearean. He was wonderful uh, as um, Algernon in An Importance of Being Earnest. Mm -hmm. he, we saw him he, as Cornwall in Lear earlier in the yes, series, which was a very different true. role, but yeah. he uh, nailed the okay. yeah. yeah. Absolutely. He also played the bumbling uh, constable in Front Page. Uh, mm -hmm. Which once again, he he does he, he plays all the he goes all over the map. He's a very versatile chameleon actor. Chameleon, he kinda yeah. Just, he kind of shows that. up in her part and goes, "Oh, you're here! Great, yeah. so fun, perfect." Mm -hmm. And then Ryan, who do you have as your? Okay, uh, so I I have I, something just like a confession, I guess, to make before I get oh. into this. So like, I just like, and that's, that's the confession. That's it. I just loved everything about it. And that's going to permeate basically all my answers <laughs> that I Great. give in this. Um, mm -hmm. So like when I was planning what I'm going to say for this question, I'm like, oh, this person and this person and this person like mm -hmm. wrote like pretty much the entire cast list. I don't think there was a single weak link in the cast. Mm -hmm. Everyone is fantastic. Um, I, on that long list, had literally all the ones you've named already, you two. Great. <laughs> um, but actually, funny enough, my top, top choice had, and that was Gabriel Long as Moth. I had our, him oh, on my yeah. list, too. Our, our wonderful 12-year-old star-making turn here in this performance. Yes. <laughs> so <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Like, oh. you know, I don't think I've ever seen a child actor perform Shakespeare that well in my life. Mm -hmm. Like, it's yes. the most of, like, the very child roles aren't that prominent to begin with or are either right. played by an older actor when they are, mm -hmm. but the fact that they got a 12-year-old who could nail it that well, I was yes. so yeah. head over moon, like, very yes. impressed. Uh, I had him on my list, too, because I had the same thing where I just went, his understanding of the text and how he made it flow so naturally where he just had it in his bones about how he was going to speak. And then on top of that, the way he held his own with all these bigger name Stratford act actors, whether it's Juan Caron, who was also on my list, because he was very mm -hmm. funny. Uh, but we'll get into him in a minute. But we're going to focus on Gabriel first. But yeah, like he just knew how to play the stage. And that's something as a 12 year when you're playing on a thrust stage, which is something that you're usually not taught until you're in theater school, just because it's not a common stage that we see a lot. But the fact mm -hmm. that he was able to come out every time, hit his marks, say the lines with comedy mind you it wasn't robotic it was no, not at all. as if he was talking like tom rooney or mike shira or, or ruby joy who had this elegant flow to the language he had that in spades with them and i had to go holy crap you deserve mm -hmm. a, an applause every time you come out because you stole the show like he absolutely came out and stole that performance as nice. mom so as yeah. much as i loved everyone that is definitely my choice and i'm glad it mm -hmm. wasn't taken yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, very true. And then I do have to, and then and then I'll give a shout out to Juan Caron as mm, Don yes. Orando Di 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 Armado. Armado, yeah, yeah, Armado. yeah. yeah. yeah Armado. Don Armado. Because first of all, having to play a character with an accent can be very tricky, when, especially when it's done for comedy, because it can become very over the top, ridiculous, mm -hmm. and just I don't want to say uh, offensive, but just kind of like that's the shtick of the character, and that's all we're gonna get from him. But he played it with, yeah. but he was still very genuine with his performance where he believed his love story with this maid. And, and he came in and he, and he just worked well with having a, a 12 year old scene partner, which some actors may just go, forget it. I'm going to just ignore you and do my thing. And yet he totally connected with Gabriel and he had, and he, and he worked through all the ridiculousness of that character to find the heart of this guy who at the end gets the final lines of the play, mm -hmm. which which as John Kerr pointed out, were very important lines because it's all about going your separate ways and then we'll meet somehow again in, in, in the universe later on. It's one of those great kind of ending monologues. And Walker mm -hmm. played it so 
sincerely, and it was wonderful. He, I, I, just even in that, even in that ridiculous Bride of Frankenstein wig that he was wearing, yeah. was wonderful. Mm -hmm. So For yeah, sure. there we go. So yeah, I mean, overall the cast, fantastic. John Caird did a wonderful job casting this show. But let's now get into what were our favorite production design elements of this production. And Jill, you look like you got a gleam in your eyes. So why don't you kick us off? <laughs> the costumes. Um, so talking about the women to start us off, I feel like um, all of their accessories and even the, the, sty the slight subtle changes to their, the style of dresses they were wearing, mm -hmm. um, the colors that, that were affiliated with them really played into their characters. Mm -hmm. Like I loved how Catherine was kind of pink and cutesy bows mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. Rosalind had a little bit more of like a grounded green vibe to her. And mm -hmm. then to me, the actress who played our Mariah was like a little ray of sunshine and she had mm -hmm. the gold accents to her. So I really mm -hmm. think the costumes played really well into that. And um, even the shrouds that the women wore, um, you know, they were highlighted with the stars and the moon to give mm -hmm. sort of an evening vibe to mm -hmm. um just breathtaking and lovely and uh because there was a lack of set i think the costumes themselves mm -hmm. were the just the right amount of spectacle that we needed yes. um even moths get up near the end when they before <laughs> they get into the nine uh, nine um nine worthies i was like oh my gosh like again this is just another elaborate costume that just adds another little spice to what we're watching. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and then and then talking to Boyette and Armado's hair. Like those again, <laughs> on, the, on the male side, their, their hair and makeup on point as well. Um, mm -hmm. And Doll, sorry, I have to talk about Doll a little oh. bit too because his hair just really played into, he had sort of three stooges comedy to me. That's, yes. that's kind of the vibe I was getting from him. Mm -hmm. And then with the hair just kind of added that the bowl Two? cut. Yeah, yeah. And with the so, hat that was the same shape as his yes. hair. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> so um, even going down to the, the fact that the women were bare chested, like I know that was a traditional look to have anyways, but then pair mm -hmm. that with their immense agency and sort of they would rule a lot of the scenes. I liked, mm -hmm. you know, seeing a little bit of skin as well. It kind of played mm -hmm. into their... Um, independence and also temp temptress sort of vibes too so yeah yeah and i think every the, the costumes were hands down my favorite design element. very good katie what do you think what's your favorite element of the show yeah i i also agree with jill that the i wrote the costumes in act five scene two holy and i think, <laughs> was, I, think I think that was like the uh yeah it was when it was it was the second costume of, of the women in the show mm -hmm. um when they're kind of like dressed up for for the kind of like ball i guess is that yeah the evening yeah, the, the yeah. Evening gowns yes yeah they were spectacular and then mm -hmm. the other thing i was i was they, i don't know if this technically counts as a, like a production design but i thought like the fact that it was all on a thrust stage was really mm -hmm. like the thrust stage itself was really really interesting to me because i i've never seen anything at stratford i'm not i'm not from ontario oh. like I, yeah never i've never looked at any of like i've literally this is my first stratford production i've ever seen okay and um and so the a the intimacy of the space mm -hmm. which i feel like is so kind of honestly kind of necessary for a lot of Shakespeare mm -hmm. because it is so interactive yes. with the with the audience mm -hmm. um yeah and the, and the thrust stage in itself I was like oh the audience must feel like they are a part of the action like they are like you do this, like, you do when you're in the, yeah. when you're in the festival theater for a like a oh, okay. 2,000 1,200 big over a thousand seat uh yeah. balcony theater the thrust it does feel rather small and we're actually on that stage it doesn't feel as big as uh, as you think it is it's, it's a much smaller space but yet they used it really well so yes the thrust stage brilliant by yeah, tanya mozeyevich oh okay uh, yeah i so thought that was, was like yeah. yeah very cool yeah mm -hmm. yeah well done okay well i'll go into mine because i know ryan will just praise everything uh <laughs> but that's true but my <laughs> element uh is the music I thought the music of this production was outstanding. Mm -hmm. like, I, I, like it had that cinematic underscore in moments with the brass and the drums and the lutes. But then on top of that, you also, it also fit the time period of that like Jacobean um, 1700s kind of era of history. And it just kind of filtered its way through as if it was kind of trickling through this foresty glen where a lot of this stuff takes place in out in the fields. And and Shakespeare writes all these beautiful songs in his plays, but a lot of times they're either cut or people don't know what to do with them. But yet this time, John Caird, once again, I guess because of his musical background, 
knew how to do these beautiful musical moments in the, in the play. Like the ending with the cuckoo song was gorgeous. Like, like yeah. with them all. And then the fact it ends with a little bird sound, like a real bird sound at the end. I was mm-hmm. like, oh, John Caird, you cheeky man. <laughs> well yeah. done to you. And yeah, Shakespeare, Shakespeare music. A lot of people forget he, how musical he is because that, that was a very courtly thing was you'd do a speech or, or, or you'd recite something and then you would have some music or a masked dance or whatever at the end of your night. And people forget that. And Shakespeare wrote those in and John Kerr just knew how to do it. And it yeah. sounded great. And so I was so happy at the end in the curtain call when you got to see the band actually come out onto the balcony there and everybody applauded because I was like, you deserve that. You guys did really well with what you were given. So yeah. bravo to the music. Ryan, what is your favorite element? <laughs> so funny thing, even though mm-hmm. I love absolutely everything about this production, um, mm-hmm. the three things that I wrote down as like, first and possible backups were the three kind of things that were all mentioned oh, but, I, but I have things to add I guess okay. uh, Very so good. Like, add away. Start, starting with the costumes one of my favorite ones in the show was Armado's costume with the letters kind of poking out of every single sleeve and like yes and that's just such a great interplay of like the very central prop of the letters and the poems mm-hmm being integrated directly into the costume. And then yes. in the scene where all the men are getting together and mocking each other's poetry mm-hmm. writing, yeah. uh, Longaville also has multiple like letters mm-hmm. sticking out. So it's just like, what a great little mirror there that through falling in love and writing these letters and poems, they're kind of becoming foolish, just like our motto is yes. in a way, which I thought, yeah, what a great little piece of visual imagery there for that. Um, the set I had less to say about because it was a very bare stage for the most part, but just they used the levels very well, Mm. I thought was worth remarking upon. And maybe that's more of a blocking note than a set note, but. Still part of the production. It it is part of the production. Uh, Yeah. Yeah, Jill, you want to add to that? Might I just say too, yeah, because I had a little bit, a note on on set, sort of playing with the set. It was a close second Mm -hmm. for me as well, because it really played into the fact, uh, at least how the actors interacted with the set, that like love makes you do silly things. So like Mm -hmm. the men, you know, spun around poles when they were like asking about the women or their own quite often would stick his head through the little balcony balcony, hole. Sticking his head in the hole. Yeah, and then even just, yeah, the way way they use their levels for sure, it played into the, the... Yeah, and it just goes to show, like Jill, you were saying how there isn't much set, but the costumes Mm -hmm. make up for that. Mm -hmm. But even less is sometimes more when it comes to set and you can, Really Absolutely, do well with not much, and especially on a thrust stage where where yeah. where we minute you put in blocky set pieces, you now have to mm-hmm. consider what that does with the island. We saw that last week with Time of Athens, where they had the clear chairs, as you pointed out, Jill, where mm-hmm. because they were clear chairs, you could see through them. And here, because it's even a smaller thrust than the Tom Patterson, where set is once again very limited to what you can do there. So yeah, no, they were yeah. really smart about it. Good point, Ryan. But yeah. like. One other piece of set that is worth remarking Mm -hmm. upon is like near the end when we have our like off-brand rude mechanicals play within a play. Uh, They they brought on this little like pageant wagon cart and like the costumes and that whole sequence. Like, uh, I don't know, I thought it was very funny when uh, Holofernes comes on as Judas Maccabeus with the menorah hat. And then speaking of the music, they're playing this like somewhat bit of a klezmer ditty as he's twirling around in that like... Yeah, it was just, everything yeah. was great about all or, that. or the horse, the little horse, the, yeah, the, the, horse. the priest that comes out on, on the horse. And that was so also, funny. The, yeah. yeah. Sorry, Katie, you want to go? No, I was going to jump in. Also, that, that horse scene, it took me a second to hear, but did you guys hear the crickets in the background? Yeah. Yes. I, I did it. Oh, my God. <laughs> so brilliant. Like, because it's like a, it's like a nighttime scene. So yeah. it makes sense that there are crickets. But yeah, yeah, but every time he stopped speaking, you just hear these crickets. Ryan well, Tree so played that moment so <laughs> well. I, I'll mention it now but did you guys catch when his character comes back into the audience after he has his whole stage fright moment he comes the back in and of the theater the audience, the audience like, on like, stage the audience on stage <laughs> okay, yeah yeah, yeah. um he just sneaks in ever so slightly and i feel like if, if we weren't if the, the camera wasn't on him you might have missed it but he yeah. just like comes and he's like oh he's like don't mind me i'm just joining the audience i cracked <laughs> up laughing it was so funny oh that, that really moment cute. just uh a lot of mm-hmm. laughter in the piece in little that, moments like that. That wow. moment in particular with Nathaniel on his horse, like, mm-hmm. it, that is, like, such a brilliant, I think, directing is the best 
like category to put it under because like they cut several lines of the text of what's actually like going on in that little scene mm -hmm. so like to just realize it's funnier and works better if he has this little stage fright moment it's like one of the few times i don't usually i'm not usually a big fan of cutting things out of the text because i love the text mm -hmm. so much but like i think that was such a great directorial decision that mm -hmm. just made for such a wonderful moment of meta theater yeah <laughs> that, yeah um, oh, that's and, wonderful. And yeah, the, the, once again, the songs were all lovely, not just the cuckoo one, like I mentioned, how I liked the music that was playing in the play mm -hmm. within the play, but even like yes. the earlier songs. There was one song earlier, I think it was like in Act Two or Act Three, that was with Moth and Armado and like that whole company. Yes. And that's yes. not in the text, because I was oh. following along in the text, as I often do when I'm just sitting at home watching Shakespeare on my computer. And mm -hmm. that seems to have been full cloth created for this production. Which wow. Is wonderful. <laughs> yeah, no, that moment, I, I know exactly the moment you're talking about, where it's kind of like a daytime moth comes out. Yeah, mm -hmm. and Jacketta yeah. joins them, like, and Correct. sings with them. There's this great little romantic yes. moment between Armado and her. Like, it's, yes. yeah. What, yeah, what a no, show. It's gorgeous. Yeah. Uh, I know, right? Oh, this production. <laughs> so, so good. Now, no production is perfect, and I'll kick off this section, because it's not the fault of the production, but I will say the lighting didn't stand out to me this time around, but I think that's more of just where they were in the season, because as Mike Shearer pointed out, this was like the third production some of these actors were doing, and if you don't know at the festival theater, basically what happens is the first round of productions that are going to go up at the festival get first dibs on the lighting, and then the second round and the third. So by the time you get to being a third round show of the season, you're basically working with any lights that are already preset in, right. I, 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 in the space are working with, and you kind of get to add maybe a few gobos or a light change here there, but you're kind of working with what you got. Okay. So, I mean, for them, like the lights weren't, like the lights just kind of were there. I mean, there was a few gobo moments where you had the leaves kind of filtered through, and it was, it was nice, but it wasn't like, ooh, look at the lighting. Like, it wasn't like one of those big standout-y I noticed the same thing, and that is what I had pre-planned as the weakest aspect because oh, really I good. well okay. because I liked everything else so much. But my thinking on it is that it doesn't really bother me that the that yeah, the no, lighting didn't, was yeah, unremarkable yeah. because everything else is so good. Like you don't need to also be absolutely and, no, like it, yeah, it wasn't distractingly yeah. bad or no. like, there wasn't like no, poor decision no. making within no. it. It just wasn't as showy as everything else, and I exactly. think exactly. It was subtle and did its job to just make sure we could yes. see the actors' faces. It, well, that's, that's that was exactly it. Yeah, that's exactly like yeah. It wasn't bad by any means. It just wasn't like. But I totally get what you're saying, Mac. It definitely yeah, yeah. wasn't the yeah. the most elaborate palette that we've seen in yes. this series before, and so yeah, yeah. yeah. Like Jill, what, what, what about yeah. you? What, what, what was an element for you? Yeah, I have um, as much as I, I like. I was so enthralled with this piece, and it's it's the favorite one I've seen thus mm -hmm. far. Um, there were like little moments or little chunks of, of direction that mm -hmm. maybe didn't really sit as well with okay. me. Um, and I'm probably gonna, everyone is gonna have the altering opinion to the series of things I'm gonna say. So okay. um, uh, I thought the the song at the end for me went on a little too long. The cuckoo um, song or the song yeah, after that? The, the cuckoo song, like the very the end. Song. Okay. I've already seen this chemistry that this cast has throughout the whole piece and even mm. interweaving the A plot and the B plot together. Mm. I didn't need there to be that long of a meditation. Right. Of, I, I think I just if you stripped a couple verses from that song, mm -hmm. I would have been happier. To me, it right. just went on a little too. And I think, yeah. which brings it to my second point, and it isn't really to do with the production, but it's the filming of the production. Mm. I think okay. the way they filmed that piece also threw mm. me off. It seemed right. a bit cheesy to me, ah, uh, to okay. the way they kind of went in and out. And then right. I'll speak to that as well. Um, some of the filming of this was a bit weird to me. Like I loved being able to see the princess and king's meet cute, but I think mm -hmm. the way that it was filmed, mm -hmm. the scope that we were given being the YouTube audience members, mm -hmm. It was strange for me. Same with at the, the end when the women mm -hmm. are departing from the men. Mm -hmm. um, again, it was, it seemed rushed. Like I, mm -hmm. I wasn't, I, I wanted to know kind of more or maybe have more of a um, zoomed out view of them gotcha. leaving as opposed mm -hmm. to kind of weaving through. It, it was mm -hmm. creative. Like it was definitely a filming style. I don't think we've seen yet. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so, and especially, in, it, it just really kind of 
came out to me near the end because especially mm-hmm. when that French messenger comes in to deliver news of the French king, um, yeah. I thought that was a really cool scope to start. Mm-hmm. But then uh, I didn't really like how it was a bit like shifty, shaky. I could get yeah. what it was saying of being like, we're the bearer of bad news. Like mm-hmm. this whole merriment scene is now going to mm-hmm. be broken by the demise I bring you. But yeah. again, it just, it didn't sit extremely well with me. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's really nothing to do with the production, just like well, the filming I, quotient I like of Jill. it. I, I, I feel like I, for the most part, agree with you on that, although I won't say it stuck out, stuck out to me as much. There was, however, in defense of the cinematography, I guess, uh, one moment in particular where it was also creative camera work, like you're saying, that I thought worked really well. Hmm. And that was in Barone's monologue, the one you were talking about earlier that you performed, the camera really like got up on yes. him, swooped around, did some interesting movements mm-hmm. that really gave this gravitas to that moment yes. that wouldn't have been there in the theater. But I see that as a moment that I completely love in the stage show. Yeah. That actually catapults me to my next thing. Mm-hmm. There needed to be, because that monologue to me, it, it sort of encompasses, it's, it's kind of the heartbeat of the piece, to be mm-hmm. honest, um, like the underbelly of, of all, what all these characters are going through or have gone through. Mm-hmm. Um, I wanted there to be more of a meditation post Barone's mm-hmm. monologue. Like I wanted to sit with it a little bit more, but I feel the, the men just kind of jumped right in and, and carried on and it worked. It did work. Mm-hmm. It didn't, it wasn't too distracting, but we've had stuff like this happen in, in the past productions we've discussed in the series too, where um, just the, the switch of, of tone and, and mm-hmm. where the scene's going happens a bit too speedy for mm-hmm. me. Um, so there, there were, and there were a couple moments too, where I think a bit more of set back and meditating on, on, the, mm-hmm. the love of the language and the fact that the language is, is talking about love. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was a moment that, and then um, one, th- the, my last thing that was just a little bit, and it's totally contrast to all of us. So apologize, I guess, but it wasn't that I didn't like his performance. I, again, it was just on the fence of, could it be played older or could it be played by someone else was Moth. Um, oh, no. Yeah, I just, I know I've seen a lot of Shakespeare productions with a lot, like that had a, have a lot of their um, children company members. And it's not that mm-hmm. I don't think he did a good job. I just know um, like uh, other kids that are his age that I think could have done just as well as him. As um, mm-hmm. And so I don't think he was miscast at all, but I think just the character of Moth itself, um, it's, I, I kind of wanted to see someone older in it for some reason. Like I know he's supposed to be the young servant to our motto, mm-hmm. but um, there were just some moments where I did feel the age shift of mm. the cast that was on stage and him. And, and it wasn't that either or's performances or energy sort of giving and taking was off. It mm-hmm. just, I don't know. It was just, maybe it was like a chemistry thing for me, but mm-hmm. um, so if I were to have like a weakest character, I would, I would say Moth, but the character itself and not the actor, if that mm. makes any sense. But Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Fair enough. That's, Katie? Sorry, that's, that's mine. <laughs> Very good. Katie, what about you? Um, the thing for me that I found, which actually might be a product of the filming or the lighting, so I don't, I don't quite know, <laughs> but I found, um, uh, I found, I found the, the whole contrast of like the, uh, like the colors of the costume and the color of mm-hmm. the set, I found it very kind of like, like brown mm. scale like I found right. I thought that it wasn't it, I, I wish that there was like something a little bit more vibrant mm. um and especially too when we have the contrast of like the kind of like the scholarly like academia of mm-hmm. of the men and then these like beautiful women who come in in these like beautiful dresses mm-hmm. and like I almost mm-hmm. wish that it was uh yeah just more contrasting because I especially mm-hmm. too because I feel like these women are represented of like love which is kind of Mm -hmm. like ultimately kind of the foil to like academic academia Mm -hmm. or whatever where Mm -hmm. I guess we learned it isn't so at the end but like Mm -hmm. you know and and I kind of wish that they were they were more brightly colored you know we kind of have these beautiful like greens and pinks and blues and I just wish that it was yeah that that, that the costumes like color wise just like popped a little bit more yeah um yeah, but again, that might be, yeah, again, a, a product of the lighting or of the, the camera work, Could like very maybe well it was yeah. in person too. Um, but yeah, that was kind of the only thing that, that uh, uh, kind of hit me. I was like, oh, this feels all very, like, very bland. <laughs> like, I don't know, like, especially, yeah, with like the set and things that was all mm. kind of like in kind of like brownish, like, 
tones. Yeah, I found mm-hmm. it. I found it just a little a bland. Yeah, it would have been yeah. cute to see. Kate, now that you said that, because um, I do agree with you, the brown sort of definitely. Um, accent the academia side that the, the show starts off it, it would have been kind of yeah. cute to see once these women go on stage and obviously they have a heavy impact on the men almost mm-hmm. if they like left behind a prop or did something to the set that kind yeah. of transformed it into mm-hmm. you know adding little sprinkles of of love to the set itself like you know mm-hmm. that i don't know that would have been like yeah. a cute which is kind of interesting because idea, yeah. it's it's actually like the men who give these individual tokens to the women that they each wear yeah. that in the mask yes. scene is what they use to misidentify each one. So like, <laughs> yeah, it's interesting like the, to then propose, oh, well, maybe the women can do the same and give something bright yeah. that sparks the same way. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, why do the men even have these colorful tokens in the first place mm-hmm. in their, yeah, you know, they, cloistered academic life? <laughs> they leave an impression on them mm-hmm. too, right? Mm-hmm. To kind of, yeah. so it's, mm-hmm. they're kind of the cat- catalyst of that. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Very true. Good mm. point. But yeah, that's what I found. Yeah. Very good. Ryan, is there anything that you found didn't quite work? Or are you well, thing the again, <laughs> I'm agreeing with you that there could have been more with the lights, but mm-hmm. I do not think it held down the production. I mm-hmm. see the points that the others are making, but again, nothing really like stood out to me as, ooh, I would really change this. I mm-hmm. really gonna yeah, for me this one's ten out of ten, but very good. Okay. Well, in that case, Ryan, as our resident TA, yes. as, as, I, as I identify you as many a time, <laughs> do you think this production hit the mark and is it worth a watch by other people? No, I don't think it hit the mark at all. No, of course I think it hit the mark <laughs> after all that phrase. Uh, um, no, okay, so I think a big part of why this one really just clicked for me so much mm-hmm. is because I had never seen a production of this play before. I've read it before. Mm-hmm. And on the page, I've never loved the display. I mm-hmm. thought it was like boring. It's a slog. There's, mm-hmm. it's so long and literally nothing happens until the very end. I've never been a fan of this play before. Seeing this production made me love this play. Mm. And it was just so well done. And the cast had like, they found the humor and everything. Mm. It's like, I was laughing aloud through most mm. of it. When the chimes of the bells came at the end, I was hit hard by it, even though I knew right. it was coming. And mm-hmm. yeah, like, I think this, I, relative to my expectations, because I will admit, being not a big fan of this play, I wasn't necessarily looking forward to watching this one. <laughs> and like, yeah, but then I, boy, am I happy to have been proven wrong. And I was so thrilled by it. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I really think it just, yeah, it hit all the marks for me. I'm very mm-hmm. satisfied with it. And, mm-hmm. you know, framing your question as would I show students this one, I think definitely yes, mm-hmm. especially if it's a class where they're just expected to read uh, the show and not necessarily see it. I would recommend, okay, on the page, sure, maybe you enjoyed it, maybe you don't, but watch this production and tell me, did you still not like it? Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Very good. Katie, how about you? Yeah, I I kind of agree with Ryan that like I, I wouldn't read this play. No. I find it a little like to be totally honest, like the play itself, like there's no conflict, you know, like it's yeah. very like, or like it's very minimal until like the mm-hmm. very end and then her father's dead. Like it's like, it's yeah. it's very yeah. kind of like, like, oh, we're in love and we're, you know, speaking poetically with kind of like mm-hmm. a little bit. So the play itself, I don't, I don't mm-hmm. love to be honest. I'm yeah. kind of like, I like the, I, I appreciate the language and I, mm-hmm. I think that like wordplay wise, like this is like, clearly what it would like Shakespeare's like one of his most kind of infused with his own kind mm-hmm. of like wit and and wordplay yeah. mm-hmm. place um but yeah then again like the production out of, of it is and I mm-hmm. always say this where like Shakespeare is not meant to be read like it's it's funny my, my partner he's always like I don't get Shakespeare and I'm like that's because you've never seen Shakespeare mm-hmm. like it's not it's not meant to be yes. it's not meant to be read it's meant to be it's meant to be um, meant to be seen, you know? So yeah. I think that like after seeing it, it's definitely mm-hmm. more, much more engaging than, than um, yeah, than I think that the, the play is just like book wise. So uh, calling Shakespeare a book, a book. But yeah, so I think like the production itself is beautiful. Mm-hmm. And obviously like yeah. the actors are very, very good and the direction mm-hmm. is great. I 
yeah. the you know the costumes are beautiful and like yeah it's a fun yeah. a fun night mm-hmm. at the theater yeah mm-hmm. yes totally. very yeah. good jill how about yes. you i have written oh yeah um <laughs> for various reasons um so i've said this a lot in our previous chats i'm a huge fan of taking shakespeare and and making it modern or at least mm-hmm. giving it a flair that lends mm-hmm. to a modern audience just mm-hmm. so that you can get as many butts in the seats that will understand what's happening mm-hmm. on stage and you don't have to be an academic you don't have to be literate in Shakespeare mm-hmm. you can like Katie was saying just have a fun night of theater and, and mm-hmm. um, really get something from it even if it's just mm-hmm. a vibe or um, not, not understanding what every every word is being said on stage mm-hmm. however I do think this company has done a, like I've said before a brilliant job of really making all the colors that are on the page come to life Um, And so I've written, yeah, I think it's Mm -hmm. the most colorful language that we've had so far in this Mm -hmm. series. You literally could taste some of the words that they were Mm -hmm. saying and the brilliant toying, um, using gesture, nonverbal, like there were so many nonverbal reactions that were hilarious Mm -hmm. that a lot of the B-plot characters would use, like a guffaw or a a loving sigh or something. Mm -hmm. Um, So not only were we the language itself recited was was beautiful and elaborate but it was the whole all of the different categories that language encompasses so nonverbals and music um the altering of pitch of mm-hmm. of the verse that we heard in this piece gestures so i think um when it goes to showing this piece or having people come see this piece there's so many different elements you can grab mm-hmm. from it either being an actor or a student or just a person joining or coming to the festival or wanting to get an introduction to Shakespeare. Um, Mm -hmm. I also think this, the B plot that we've had is the best B plot that we've had in this Mm -hmm. whole series so far. Um, I almost liked it better than the main plot sometimes. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. And just like the laughter was such a treat and um, Mm -hmm. Mike Sharon, and Ruby Joy and John Carradine, they're, pre-show chat we're talking about how um especially with comedy the presence of an audience is so vital and it it really does add um the relationships between the characters on Mm -hmm. stage um and in the theater as a whole Mm -hmm. and i think again that really helped take that like traditional language and making it modern like just some examples i wrote down at one point um i forget who he directs it oh i think he's directing it to costard but barone literally says dick and clearly, mm-hmm. yeah. you know, it's a Shakespearean <laughs> lingo, but but he says it in such a modern way that everyone's mm-hmm. cackling. Um, yeah. The king counting out the iambic pentameter of the of the verse <laughs> that he's writing. Yeah. Or or yeah. Longaville, you know, going off, spitting his mm-hmm. verses and then snapping, you know, because yeah. yeah. everyone in the audience can be like, snaps for Longaville. <laughs> so yeah. it's those modern gestures that I think uh, catapulted mm-hmm. this piece into definitely showing to um, and just such a connected company. And again, going mm-hmm. back to John Carrick saying how the rehearsal process, he really wanted it to be like a chemical reaction of how mm-hmm. he wanted to get to know his actors and know how they tick and know their antics mm-hmm. and know their quirks and place that onto the character and then kind mm-hmm. of have that altruistic relationship of actor, character, character, mm-hmm. actor. Yeah. And I think that really showed. And I think that the um, sort of end song being a meditation in that, it, it really the audience mm-hmm. will will definitely, if they hadn't seen it already, realize that mm-hmm. this piece is, is a really good um, company piece and, and an amazing introduction mm-hmm. to Shakespeare. I'm glad, yeah. Katie, this is your first <laughs> one that you've seen. Um, so I have alliteration, too, for the lack of landscape, because we talked about how, you know, it's a bit more of a teared-down set and yes. um, lends lots of love to the language. So I really yeah. felt steps, that, steps, too. Steps, steps, steps. So yeah. even though, yeah, this is a wordy piece and there wasn't a lot of set, I think I think all the yeah. components sort of accented each other. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, and I also think, again, going back to John Caird, um, he played into a lot of his company's strengths. Like, mm-hmm. you could tell... You know, like the true comedians, they really were able to kind of press that button. Or even um, the gentleman playing Dumaine, his acrobats were impeccable. And clearly, yeah. you know, yeah. that's a director in rehearsal, you know, either asking, can anyone do this? Or the actor was like, I can do this, this. And it's the classic case of like, be careful what you say in the rehearsal hall. Because it was yeah. safe. Yeah. But there, he just did a really good job of highlighting them as artists, yeah. too. Um, yes. So I think that's that's a, mm. a great cherry on top of this piece of white mm. too so beautiful yeah. 
And I will piggyback off all of you and say, mm-hmm. absolutely, this is a great piece to show. Uh, most of it's definitely not one of my favorite Shakespeare plays. I saw this back in, I think, 2008, 2009, in, one of my, in my first year at the Stratford Shakespeare School, when I was a novice of Shakespeare. I remember being bored out of, the, out of my tree watching that <laughs> version. I don't remember who directed it or who was in it. I just remember being there going, nothing is happening. And I've been at rehearsal all day. Now you're expecting me to sit through a three hour long play in a nice warm theater. I think a lot of us dozed off that night. Um, but, but this version was so lovely. Like it was just a great fun piece of theater. And I have to say, cause John Caird commented on how Anthony Chimiliano and him really tried to make this a multiracial cast mm. where it was just, didn't matter like what ethnicity you were. It just like, they were just like, whoever was good for the part, Yes, you do the part. Also, yeah. I think, sorry, Beck, do you want to, oh, don't interrupt, but yeah. Uh, sure. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, like, I'll just say, like, because of that, like, this is one of the other great pieces of Shakespeare to watch, because a lot of times I feel in Shakespeare, I hate to say it, but we do sometimes, uh, as an all-white panel, uh, mm-hmm. pigeonhole ourselves and go, we're, we sometimes put up, put, up, put up our walls a bit against casting different ethnicities and different Shakespearean parts. And the fact that John Kerr was like, doesn't matter. As it, it, it doesn't matter if you're Black, White, Asian, whatever. Mm-hmm. If you can do the part, you can do it. Mm-hmm. And I think that really showed here. Like, race was never a thing that came into my mind. I was just like, okay, this is the version of uh, whoever that we're watching on stage. And that was that. It was, it was wonderful. And it was crazy. And I think that's why this production should be seen by a lot of people. Because it shows Shakespeare can be done by anybody. Don't ever let a casting director say, you can't do a part because of your ethnicity mm-hmm. or your race or how you look because... You can. It's it, it's Shakespeare's yeah. that Shakespeare's beautiful that way, and John mm-hmm. Kerr really highlighted that in this production in a really nice, subtle way, where it wasn't like bonking over the head with it. It was just here's our cast. They were really good together. They had great chemistry, and now watch the show. Yeah, and that was it. Oh. So yeah, Ryan, you want oh. to add in? Yeah, if I could chime in on that because yeah. I've been usually the voice on these panels who criticizes some of the ways race is handled in these mm-hmm. productions, and I agree, it was very well done. Uh, in this production. Um, I won't go as far to say that I think it's completely colorblind or that you never think of it and maybe part of Mm -hmm. this is because I was hand like following along in the text in front Mm -hmm. of you already but like there was a lot of very good deliberate choices I think that were Mm -hmm. made Mm -hmm. like given the races of and like you know identities of the certain like but one of my favorite moments in this entire production was in the scene where the men are all going over their poems with each other and Jill's yeah. talking, you know which one I'm going to talk yeah, about. Yeah, yeah, and, Dumaine, yeah. Uh, yeah, the king chimes in about how Barone's use of the word black isn't yeah. very good and Dumaine just like pauses, raises his eyebrow <laughs> and it's just such a perfect like hang a lampshade Love on that. that. Again, that's like a, a modern, definitely a modern nod yeah. to yeah. like, of course yeah. that is that line, of course, yeah. Yes. But what you, what you might have missed with that is that if you're following along in the text, in the text, not only do they not acknowledge that, hey, that's a weird thing to say, King, but there's actually like 10 lines after where they all just go back and forth piling on like the the use of the word black and different connotations and meaning for that. That was very tastefully cut immediately yeah. after that moment with Dumain. Yeah. So I think that's like a very perfect like mm-hmm. acknowledgement of the race. Like they had their like great, perfect little moment there and okay, we can do away with the rest mm-hmm. of this. Speaking of changes, another moment that I actually wrote down in here that, again, wouldn't notice at all if you weren't following along, but uh, Hmm. it's uh, so when the couples are all about to part ways near the Mm -hmm. end and uh, Barone says to Rosaline, by this soft hand, how soft a hand God knows, and he does like a funny like pause and rhythm of that line and the audience got into it. But in the text, they don't use the word soft. What they use it? the word white hmm. by this white oh. hand, how white God knows. Mm-hmm. And considering that the actress playing Rosaline was not, does not have white hands, mm-hmm. for lack of a better word, I think that was a very like appropriate, just simple change yeah. that, like I commented in our Coriolanus video, how there was the one line that when he wipes off his blood and he say, you'll see how fair my face is. Right. And that Andre Sills did a pause on the word fair because it mm-hmm. acknowledges right. that. But I think they could have done something similar for this, but I think mm-hmm. it just worked better to just change yeah. the word simply and do that. Yeah, and, one and that comes last... from John Caird. That definitely comes yeah. from John Caird, mm. knowing his Shakespeare, knowing how yeah. to yeah, adjust he it understands. and cut it appropriately. 
he understands that the word white there isn't trying to be a race thing, that it's mm -hmm. supposed to be a compliment, so why yes. not replace it with another compliment, because obviously that shouldn't be a compliment. That, I also yeah. think soft is, it was a wonderful choice, too, because it just contrasted um, the way that Rosaline was played in this production. She kind of mm -hmm. had a bit more, like, hardness, like, crass, so it was lovely yeah. here to be, like, soft in their, mm -hmm. in their interaction before they parted. Yeah, so... Yeah. Yeah. Wouldn't and even like, have noticed yeah. that, and, but love, love that that was changed. Yeah, yes. and one love. last one that Ooh. I will kind of point out. Uh, mm -hmm. It's from like the very beginning, before Jacinetta mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. comes in for the first time. Uh, there's a dialogue mm -hmm. between Armado and Moth, and Armado's mm -hmm. like building up about the fact that, oh, he's so in love with this woman. <laughs> and they're talking about various mythological figures who've been in right. love, and they get on the subject of Samson and Delilah. And nice. uh, he asks, he inquires about Samson's love's complexion, which oh. is such like an easy thing to miss. But then when you cast a black actress in that role, mm -hmm. suddenly mm -hmm. there's like a whole new way of reading that line and understanding that mm -hmm. it's not necessarily just a class divide that's separating these two characters that needs to be overcome for their love to prevail, mm -hmm. that there is this ethnic or cultural or racial divide as well that mm -hmm. I they didn't make a big thing about, I think, to their credit, it's better they didn't, but little yeah. certain lines are played very well when you do this type of diverse casting. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think the show is all the better for it. Yeah, for sure. agreed. Yeah. Perfect. Okay, well now let's head into some more play-based questions, because we've kind of pr praised the production very well, but now let's get into some of the fun stuff about this play. So in case any of you don't know, uh, in, uh, in in an early folio of Shakespeare's text, there is another play named Love's Labors One, and it is considered by oh, some yeah. scholars to be a lost sequel play to Love's Labors Lost. Now, some people also say it could just be a different title that Shakespeare was working under, and, and I have to remember it that way. Uh, who knows? But do we think this play warrants a sequel? Uh, Katie, why don't you kick us off this time? Oh no, I, <laughs> I, okay, no, only because, like, I, 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 I think, I don't know what I'm trying to say here, I think there, I'm not this, this means, I, I think there are other Shakespeare plays that I would rather see sequels to, Fair this enough. is not, like, the first one that I'm, like, mm -hmm. oh yeah, like, what's gonna happen to mm -hmm. the princess and the king, like, I, right. yeah, I think, I think I kind of like where it ends, and also, too, I like the end of this play, because, uh, it's very different from, kind of, regular Shakespeare comedies, mm -hmm. like, no one is, no one's married, no, you yeah. know, I guess one person dies, but it's not kind of, like, the, like, the, the pinnacle of the story mm. and, and I kind of I kind of like that the women were left to their own agency I was kind of mm. like okay I mean I guess it, it's kind of uh, 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 stated that they they will be married eventually mm -hmm. but no I kind of liked this that they were like no you go do your own thing for a little bit and then we'll kind of mm -hmm. we'll kind of meet up later and I was like yeah. I think that that's a good way to end this to mm -hmm. be like no, they are separate agencies, and then you know maybe we can we can imagine them coming together, you know, mm -hmm. later on or down the future. So I'm I'm gonna say no. I don't know. Ooh, I, yeah, I guess I like that. yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna give a controversial opinion and say no. <laughs> I think that this ends the way that it should end. Yeah. Fair enough, Jill. Yeah. Where yeah, do you stand? So I'm gonna say yes, absolutely. But I do agree with what some of the things Katie was saying. Like it could definitely be left. I do like how there's a different ending. Mm -hmm. The women do yeah. have more agency. So, but mm -hmm. I do think there's many different options that could be taken for a sequel mm -hmm. if they wanted to, especially um, because one hasn't really been done yet. You could make a modern sequel to this. You don't even have to necessarily Ooh. make it originally Shakespearean sort of um, atmosphere too. Ryan's but... wheels are turning. I can see it. <laughs> wheels going on. Well, there is a musical. There's a musical. There's several. Is there? Yeah, yeah. yeah there's are... a musical of Love's Labor. Lo that's usually done very modern. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. For yeah. for is yeah. it a sequel like a musical? For Love's Labor's Lost. No, no. It's it's, oh, okay. it's the Love's Labor's Lost. Yeah. Cool. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. 
Um, so lovely. So you could go around, use that same vein to kind of jump mm. into the sequel if you need, but yeah, just rolling yeah. back uh, from a plot perspective, I think it would be kind of neat to, I'm always wanting to know more about these characters. I talked yeah. about this in Mackers. Like I want to know more about the McDuffs. I want to just be a fly on the wall, the mm -hmm. McDuff family. So same thing when you pose this question, Mac, I was like, oh, because at first I was like, well, yeah. And then when I really thought about it, um, I, there's so many different things you can do. You could do, um, you know, the time before they meet up after the 12 months, you know, you could have two different lenses. You figure, what, what are the women doing? What are the men doing when they're not together? Um, you know, what story does that tell? Or when yeah. they could play the sequel, when they do meet up after that year mark, have people changed? What has happened? Are they still in love? Are the, are the couples intermixed now like what what's what's the drama um right. you could also because i was saying this b plot was so strong and definitely those were the some like the lump of characters i think i wanted to know more about mm -hmm. um you could even do like jack and Etta's baby or something along those <laughs> lines of of you know what happens what happens with them you know yeah. um there was supposed to be a duel that happened between Costard and Armado. Like, Ooh, did yeah. they resolve? You know, did, <laughs> the, like, there's little yeah. things that it would be. I feel like that one's already resolved by the time we get to the end of this play, though. They're in a play together. Like, Maybe that changes, you know? They kind of have to be on their best behavior once the French messenger comes. But, you know, yes. there's certainly things that weren't um, put to a, to a complete mm -hmm. halt. So, yeah. Yeah, so I just think there's there's definitely room for characters to expand. And because this is a comedy, I think you definitely have some artistic liberty mm -hmm. of of expanding their their characteristics and and mm -hmm. what their future would be. I also think this remind this kind of sparked um, an idea too of a potential prequel to this Ooh. as well. Um, you know, I want to know a bit more about the the sort of princess of France ladies in waiting. Like I want to know about their relationship, you know, how did that come to be? Um, like uh, the, the whole academic side of the men, we get that they're, they're academics, but mm -hmm. you know, what, what brought them to that? You know, the play kind of just starts in, in midair almost, you know, right. and you're, you're immediately in it and you're along mm -hmm. for the ride, but there's, there's, there is wonderful little pockets of, yeah. um, wanting to know more either before mm -hmm. or after so yeah. yes and maybe a prequel mm, very <laughs> good okay uh ryan how about you all right i have to agree with katie that i don't think this play warrants a sequel Ooh. sorry jill i do think i definitely <laughs> see where okay. you're coming from jill warrants he like purposely <laughs> emphasized no warrants. i will say I, I can definitely see the room for a sequel and if one mm -hmm. was in fact written I like have no questions that it probably would have been interesting and like mm -hmm. there's certainly like because it is technically a cliffhanger ending like I wouldn't be surprised why mm -hmm. like you often hear things about just like the you know supply and demand of the Elizabethan theater market where mm -hmm. like you know there's a very conjectural theory that the only reason why Shakespeare wrote Mary Wives of Windsor is because Queen Elizabeth loved Falstaff and wanted to see what would happen if he fell in love like yeah. <laughs> um so so play. I I wouldn't be surprised, like, if, oh, man, the audience really loves these characters and you left them yeah. on such a cliffhanger, Shakespeare, write another one. And he's like, well, if that'll pay for another season at the Globe and then I could write the Hamlet that I really want, like. <laughs> um, but what I think my reason for saying no is because I think that actually would defeat the purpose of what makes this play so good. And I, as I mentioned before, I didn't think this play was good until watching this Right. production but now I, I'm completely on board this is a great play mm -hmm. and I mm -hmm. think it would really defeat the purpose to find out what happens next with these characters mm -hmm. and I'll just walk you through my thought process here okay. because Katie you're right when you mentioned earlier that this is a play with like no conflict nothing happens throughout mm -hmm. most of it and mm -hmm. like that yeah I, I agree and that was why for the longest time I didn't really enjoy it and what really like stuck to me like certainly reading it, but even more so watching this, is there's so many very quickly diffused setups for conflicts throughout. There's like the fact that the men have their oath and oh no, they're in love. This is going to be a big conflict that they have to, you know, grapple with. Do we keep our oath? But like, no, not really a conflict. They just break their oath and it's fine. And, <laughs> and like the fact that like these four ladies show up to the four men, they all immediately fall in love with one of them. There's no overlap between any of them, like no yeah. conflict or disagreement there. And then there's the whole thing with Costar mixing up the two letters and you think, oh, I know how comedies work. This is going to 
will lead to some much ado about nothing type of uh, mm -hmm. confusion. But this is a play much ado about nothing minus the much ado part. It's just nothing. It's, they quickly realize, oh, this letter was meant for this person. This letter was meant for this person. And it doesn't actually turn into a conflict at all. And then near the end, the ladies do their whole like trickery where they're going to put on the masks and, and the whole yeah. Russian mask <laughs> thing. And like you think, okay, is this going to be where the conflict finally happens? And it doesn't. And they're just, haha, we had a good laugh with you. And then we, they watch their, like, like I said, the off-brand version of mm -hmm. the Rude Mechanicals from its summer. And then... Yeah. So you feel like the play's got to be over soon, but literally nothing has been a conflict. And then <laughs> chime, chime, chime. Oh no, the conflict is at the very end. And I think yes. dramaturgically yeah. what's happening here is this whole play is an elongated first act of a more traditional comedy. Mm -hmm. That the inciting incident that would put a wedge between the lovers and set, a, set in motion the entire, okay, this is what we need to overcome to get to the mm -hmm. prescribed happy ending, as is the way of mm -hmm. comedy is very much not given to us. And the, I think the whole point of writing an entire play of that pre-inciting incident is like somewhat of an experiment to dramaturgically see, can that be a whole play? And can a comedy have an unhappy ending? And like, mm -hmm. obviously tragic comedies are a lot more popular now than they were in Shakespeare's day. Like Eric Bentley mm -hmm. famously defined tragic comedy is just a comedy with a unhappy ending and like I think it's maybe a little melodramatic to call this a tragedy like or tragic even like Aristotle would have conniptions if he heard us using that language but I think to me demanding a sequel to this play as mm -hmm. perhaps was the case back in early modern England is like demanding a sequel to Once or Blue Valentine or any love story <laughs> that doesn't end happily because that's not the point yeah. of this journey mm -hmm. we're supposed to and I get that it is a cliffhanger because the couples are still in love but are forced to part but mm -hmm. that doesn't mean that I necessarily need to see what happens. It might be a great or no, um, but yeah, I'm very satisfied with the play we're given here. And it almost kind of reminds me a bit of like an R and J or an Othello plays that start off with the comic framing and then take very tragic turns very quickly. Um, like both of those plays are frequently described as the setup of a comedy just to have that like rug pull of, oh no, now it's tragic. This is just like a lighter, diet version of that <laughs> I'm here for fair it enough. fair enough I will have to agree with Jill though I think this play does get it does, does not warrant a sequel but it leaves itself most available for a sequel like all of Shakespeare's plays and very much with the button at the end and it's like whether it's a midsummer or or um or, or, or any of the other comedies there's very much kind of like that ending where it's like okay great, that story is being seen, act five acts, we've told the story, we're good. Here, because you're right, nothing really happens. Like we need like a Don John from Much Ado to show mm -hmm. up in this play and start messing with the couples. And that's what you could do for a sequel. Like I think this play, Shakespeare wrote, because it's like this one of his earlier plays in his canon mm -hmm. when he was writing, that you know, it's very much like a young writer leaving himself open to doing a sequel follow-up play because why not? I mean, these characters, there's so many places you could go. Like, the Talk about dramaturgy. So There'd be a dramaturge's heyday, you know? <laughs> you have so many different plot points or, or yeah, <laughs> like relationships so many ways. Kind of go off. <laughs> so, yeah, I think, I, 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 think, I think this play does leave itself open for a sequel, and I think it's one where you kind of go in a lot of different directions with the characters. Give them some conflict that they actually have to work through. Because this was a great setup play where it's like, okay, great, now we know who these characters are, and they set up a great premise that they got to wait another year. To, for everybody to kind of get back on track with each other. And then it's like, okay, well, where do they go? Like, there's so many great areas. It's, not, it's almost like the ending of Twelfth Night where it's like, I want to see what happens with, with like Malvolio's Revenge. Like, I want to have that kind of next part follow-up. Like, Shakespeare mm -hmm. wrote some really great cliffhangery moments in his plays where it's like, I want to see what happens next. And this is I will one of add to that, Mac. While I do agree that it could make for a very interesting play, and I'm not even going to say, but still they shouldn't, but <laughs> I think if they do, and I don't know who this is they I'm talking about, is Shakespeare? <laughs> I, I don't know. But like, it's you, but Ryan. It, You're going to write the secret. Sure. I don't think they're... <laughs> I, I don't think, who they is. <laughs> I don't... My, my big thought is I don't think there should be a Don John type messing things up. Mm -hmm. Just the fact that we got through this whole first play with like 
no villain and no like mm -hmm. conflict with a character like I think like Jill was saying we can have some great drama of just these are different people now after this yeah I, I think yeah. it's just like fun funziness you know mm -hmm. it would be like yeah. super farcical and like funny mm -hmm. that's what because I do love the way that this piece just sits at the end mm -hmm. and it does kind of that stark switch of of like wake up mm -hmm. now we've kind of spiraled down into tragedy um mm -hmm. but it would just be almost almost like a one act even mm -hmm. just a, a one act farce of, of these <laughs> characters also, you know also something else that i think is so interesting about the end of this play is that mm. the thing that comes in at the end that finally puts an end to their merriment as or interrupts their merriment as the princess puts it it has nothing to do like with anything done with the characters it's just mm -hmm. her father's dead it very much feels like a deus ex machina but yeah a, a thanatos ex machina if you will because <laughs> it is this this death comes from outside and like mm -hmm. Contrary to being the thing that usually ends comedy is like, yay, something came and save us. Now the lovers mm -hmm. can get together. It is the perfect anti deus ex machina for the anti comedy. And that's right. what this play just is. And I think that's why I'd be very happy to leave it as it is. Mm -hmm. So I won't be the one to write the sequel, I guess is a long way of saying that. Very Mac, it looks well, like it's up to you and I. Oh, great. Yeah. Here we go. I'll, I'll add it to my writing <laughs> list of things, of, of ideas and thoughts. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. All right. Next question for us is, do we feel these characters are richly drawn or, or, or does Shakespeare kind of rely really heavily on stereotypes for like male and females, uh, um, Spaniards, Frenchmen, all that type of stuff? I, I, do we feel these characters actually have some depth to them? Or are they kind of just, eh, Katie, I see, I, I, see, I, see, I see you got an idea already forming. Go. Well, I was going to say, I mean, obviously the, the, the Spaniard is like very mm -hmm. stereotypy, like mm -hmm. super stereotypy. <laughs> um, yeah. Which is yeah. like, you know, and mm -hmm. even to the fact where he's like, you know, he's the one who's in love, like desperately, mm -hmm. he kind of like represents love in a way, mm -hmm. you know, which yeah. is like, yeah, I think that he's obviously like, like, a pretty heavy stereotype. Mm -hmm. um, but all the other characters, honestly, like, I don't, uh, and, and, but Shakespeare kind of always has a way of, like, with his, like, uh, characters who are women, making them, yeah. I feel, like, a little bit more um, uh, 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 stronger, for lack of a yeah. better word, than, like, mm -hmm. in, or than uh, a lot of lovers kind of written uh, who, are, mm -hmm. who are women. Um, yeah. So I think that those ones were definitely not as stereotyped, like, especially, like, the mm -hmm. princess, who's clearly very, like, intelligent and mm -hmm. very, um, you know, has kind of control over her, you know, over her kingdom, I guess. And yeah, uh, yeah. and even the the men weren't so stereotypy because they're, you know, they're they're falling in love, which is not mm -hmm. a like, you know, a stereotypically like masculine thing that we talk yeah. about. So I think for me, it was definitely like the like, the more kind of like fool characters mm -hmm. were definitely more stereotypy, whereas like the, mm -hmm. the lovers and, and the the leading players were, uh, yeah. were yeah, actually not as stereotypy as I, as I thought. Mm -hmm. Ryan, what do you yeah. think? Uh, I, I see both sides of this one, I guess. Um, mm -hmm. On one hand, Katie, like you said, yeah, I think they are like more richly drawn than we might initially give them credit for. Mm -hmm. On the mm -hmm. other hand, they are very cartoonish, <laughs> but I don't think that's a problem, or I don't mm -hmm. see that as a fault in the play. I think that mm -hmm. is very much, I, I get a lot of comedia vibes from this, but I think mm -hmm. Shakespeare was maybe trying to write like a standard comedian and oops they're all our, our Latino <laughs> right and, like th that kind of and like it works like their banter is all very funny it, yeah. like they bounce off each other very well and sometimes you could just have a real cartoonish running around mm -hmm. but then there are still the depths and layers too and yeah. the female characters in particular I think Kate mm -hmm. and Mariah are just like there's not enough to them to maybe the mm -hmm. princess and Rosaline definitely mm -hmm. and, get to because they have like the two more prominent suitors and get to be in the yes. more more of the spotlight mm -hmm. so i'd maybe like mm -hmm. to see more from those characters who just fall into the background but mm -hmm. i and i won't say the same about Dumain and longaville so it's almost seems like a shame that these two female characters don't even get to be as prominent as their mm -hmm. lovers i kind of disagree with that because Ooh, again i go think Joe. it goes to john Caird's direction and each of those women, in my opinion, were very much their own woman. In this production, women. yes. Yes. I would yeah. agree. Not okay. on the te in the text, which I thought is what we were referring to right now. Right. Yeah. My mm -hmm. whole thing kind of mm -hmm. talks about the text a little bit, but I guess mm -hmm. more of with without reading it and just watching this production in particular, mm -hmm. 
1000% these characters are which richly drawn and I think yes. yeah mm -hmm. and and yeah I didn't read it as I watched as Brian did um so and probably I've read it before so I'm yeah. sorry if I'm making the, it too texty now but <laughs> the women of course yeah I don't I think without the you know Kate buried in a book and Mariah's mm -hmm. sort of exuberant energy and like mm -hmm. I mentioned before ray of sunshine personality mm -hmm. uh without the, that actor choice placated onto the character for sure I don't think we would be given the same uh opportunity to kind of have access mm -hmm. to those characters um so sorry Ryan I kind of took the torch from you are you no, okay if I keep going on my I, I was basically finished go ahead <laughs> lovely <laughs> um so yeah so I think I think the production wise so again directorially mm -hmm. John Kerr did a beautiful job of making sure that every actor uh was putting a, most of themselves as mm -hmm. the character as opposed to the character dictating um you know it's not like a, a Juliet or, or um like any or a Mackers where you know mm -hmm. this is sort of the the prescription of the character and now you go mm -hmm. ahead and you you do that character mm -hmm. it the, these I, I it was it was the other way around you could really tell mm -hmm. that it was like kind of more from a, a film approach to this mm -hmm. piece uh where it's like you are you just and then you you're playing this character for the first time kind of thing mm -hmm. you know um yeah, and, and Kerr so, said something like that in the pre show yeah. interview, how, like, because he's never worked with any of these Stratford's actors yep. before mm -hmm. being the guest director, that he had to really find the ways to let them, the characters, yep. become them, which I thought, I don't, didn't write yeah, down And he said it in such a, such a visceral way to, he was like mm -hmm. saying how it's like a chemical reaction. I mentioned it mm -hmm. earlier in the chat. Um, mm -hmm. And how it was the mixture of, of that that sort of created the formula of, of what you mm -hmm. see on stage, which I thought, oh, was just beautifully said. Um, yeah, so I also think that, um, Ruby was talking about this in the pre-chat and how, um, this play is, is almost like one of the more prominent feminist pieces, um, mm. for Shakespeare too. And mm. I think in this stage production too, like we kind of, we kind of talked about this already too, but how the women, uh, again, this goes with the direction and the staging, but when they're speaking or when they're tempting it, they always seem to have the upper hand mm -hmm. um you know the whole image of the princess stalking back and forth while the king was pleading something to her i can't remember exactly when it was mm -hmm. but there definitely was um that i think it alone kind of broke stereotype for me mm -hmm. too um just the way that the characters carried themselves mm -hmm. um yeah, so that was just a little thing fair enough. Yeah. Fair enough, and I will piggyback on all you once once again. Mm -hmm. And I have and I have to say, yeah, I think the, like, I remember going into going into this because once again I had read it and I remember seeing it as drive for years ago and being like, oh, this, these characters don't really stand out. They're not all that interesting to me. They, they I thought I thought they would rely more on stereotypes, but I was like, oh, surprisingly, even even Juan Caronas the Spaniard, he actually still even though he had that accent going, he still gave his character some depth to him now mind you text wise it, shakespeare did rely on some so, so, some stereotypical concepts that we have of, of of the spaniard in love but i think overall these characters are really well drawn like like the like the men aren't just kind of guffawing brutes they are actual scholars like they are giving brains that make them question and and, and think things through and the women really they're, the, they're they're smarter than the men and shakespeare yeah. Once again, it gives a great kind of ode to women in this, where you go, where this came after Taming of the Shrew, as mm -hmm. like John Carradine and Ruby Joy point out, where it's almost kind of like a, a like a makeup for like, oh, sorry, <laughs> sorry, ladies, after Taming of the Shrew, here's a piece yeah. where like you guys are really kind of in the driver's seat, driving this plot forward. I remember Ruby saying too in that chat, it was the first Shakespeare where like women kind of have a moral advantage yes. over men. And I like the way she phrased that because yeah. definitely she said too, like women have to give off a sense of diplomat and emotions, mm -hmm. which yes. usually we kind of see one or the other in a lot yes. of other work. So mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's exactly like, because it's such an early Shakespeare, you can see like, I, I guess um, Mike Shear pointed out, there's a lot of different elements of like um, Laertes in, um, uh, 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 in, in Midsummer, or a little bit of Hamlet that kind of mm -hmm. prop, crops up a little bit in their throat. So I, I like how these this play, because it's so early, kind of gives you a sprinkling of, don't forget, down the road, Shakespeare's going Shakespeare's to write all these other great kind of well-thought-out characters. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like his first step 
into mm-hmm. that into that into that pond of writing really good complex not just your generic characters so yeah i do think this play get has characters that need need a much more consideration that we give them in the shakespeare canon of of male and female characters because i do think there's some good ones in there that we can prop up a bit mm-hmm. um so last question uh is would this uh play work with a gender flipped or non-binary version uh jill let's start with you this time yeah, so I have, have just a straight out yes. Um, okay. And I think it could go work on multiple levels as well. Mm-hmm. I think if we were to just talk about the main players and sort mm-hmm. of the A plot, um, I think the four men and the four women mm-hmm. can be interchangeable via sex, via mm-hmm. sexual orientation. I think you could go as far as every couple could have a different orientation or mm-hmm. um, be like a member of the LGBTQ community. Right. It, it, there's there's so much I think and I, I think yes like did the text do say us like men or or mention ladies but I think mm-hmm. like we've seen in this production too um in regards to sort of altering the text a little bit from mm-hmm. from a racial point of view I think you can mm-hmm. do it from from a gender point of view as well um mm-hmm. and I do think that you know opening our brains up to this question it, it would have been interesting to see this sort of extra layer played to this production mm-hmm. as well, or a production just as um, this caliber, um, mm-hmm. but done again. Uh, mm-hmm. So yeah, I, I definitely, I, I think it'd be very interesting. And again, because we've mm-hmm. talked about how this this play has a lot of space for breathing, like in regards mm-hmm. to character work, in mm-hmm. regards to staging, um, you know, you could even have little, in the transition of scenes, you could have more um couple interaction or character mm-hmm. interaction to sort of unveil a bit more um mm-hmm. orientation or identity mm-hmm. of a said character too you know right. so i think this this to me is a perfect piece to kind of amalgamate into uh so many different um slots of identity for mm-hmm. humanity and uh i think if i see it again i would definitely prefer to see um a wider spectrum on that front. Fair enough. Mm -hmm. Ryan, how about you? What are your thoughts? So to me, this seems like two separate questions almost, and I will answer it as such. Okay. Um, Because a gender flipped version of the performance and a non-binary one are not necessarily the same thing. Mm -hmm. Um, So I guess I would start with the gender flipped. I'd say I don't see why not. You certainly Mm -hmm. can, but I'm struggling to think of to what end. Because Mm -hmm. as we were just discussing, the the female characters are very strong and prominent here. Mm -hmm. So if we were to maybe do something like, oh, the the males are all played by females and the females are all played by males, I wonder what that would do for this play. And Mm -hmm. like it would almost put the female performers in these like buffoonish men roles and the female Mm -hmm. characters played by the men suddenly get that moral high ground that is usually afforded to the male characters anyway but not here. I don't think you could do that actually I think you would yeah I I agree with that I Mm -hmm. I think you you would have to give if you were to Mm -hmm. switch anything um like you definitely couldn't flip-flop you could have like four women as the men and four you need to give more identity I think to each Mm-hmm. each character and, and yeah that. so I agree with you in that in that yeah way. like I think there are ways that it could be done mm-hmm. I just think it really it couldn't just be in my mind hey let's just do a gender flip love labor's loss like mm-hmm. you really have to think about what am I trying to say with this and which yes. characters mm-hmm. if flipped will say that I think mm-hmm. perhaps like and I'm sure this has been done but the gay or lesbian versions where just the couples are all the same gender could certainly yep. work Mm-hmm. And like mm-hmm. that would be, I think, a more interesting take than just switching mm-hmm. the two groups. Mm-hmm. But uh, to then get to the other half of the question, um, would this work with non-binary performers? And I think my my it's just unequivocally yes. Let's get more gender non-conforming people into mm-hmm. the arts and make more space for that. And I think mm-hmm. it it is almost easier to do so than a more deliberate flip within the gender binary because Mm -hmm. you could theoretically put them in any Mm -hmm. possible role and just get more of that representation in there Mm -hmm. and i Mm -hmm. see no downside to that Mm -hmm. and it wouldn't even have to be to make a statement on ooh, what even is gender in this very gender Mm -hmm. rigid play it could just be Mm -hmm. no because these are talented performers who we would like to see in this production yeah what's great about two just to kind of add to that is i feel because 
this <laughs> this play is based on language it's sort of like love equals language language equals love i've mentioned this kind of before mm -hmm. there's there's really no um moments in the play that that are are uh, very physicalized or very visceral mm -hmm. nor there there does not need to be that's part of what makes this piece so what about beautiful. the backflips <laughs> well okay I mean like intertwining you know right, there's right. no <laughs> Lady M and Mackers macking mm -hmm. on each other post you know yeah. apart from you know um so again mm -hmm. I think it's just a wonderful breathing space of mm -hmm. just exploring love and love mm -hmm. itself and I think in that Barone monologue too that encompasses mm -hmm. Um, you know, there's, there's no promiscuity to that. Mm -hmm. There's no, um, you know, narrow view minded, like this mm -hmm. is who I'm talking to. Like, mm -hmm. of course it's semi rooted in Rosalind, yes. but what I really liked about these characters too, is that, um, their love for each other was never, uh, you know, overwhelming or, you know, I guess in a way linguistically sure, mm -hmm. but, um, yeah, it was, it was, it was just lovely. Their love was mm -hmm. lovely. There you go. There was there no go. rigorousness needed yes. for it. Yeah, at the core, I think this play is just about how fun it is to be in love. Yeah. At least until we get to that yeah. last somber note at the end. Yes. And so, like, you can do that with, like, any configuration for of sure. being yeah. straight, gay, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So it just works. Sorry, Katie, love yeah. is love. Yeah. Katie, what say if you? Yeah, I told Jill I was going to talk about this. My, <laughs> so my thing with Shakespeare always is there's no women. There's none. Even in this play that like, you know, for a lot of like, even the, in this play that had four very, very strong female characters, there mm -hmm. were four women in the whole show, you know, mm -hmm. and like, and too, not even talking about about non-binary people who are like so un like zero representation maybe not zero i won't say I don't, I don't know i haven't read anything not enough is, is ever written, but yeah, yeah like there's 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 no representation you know mm -hmm. and and so i would love to see i want to see an all-female production of this yeah. show mm -hmm. you know why not or, or all non non-male production of the show because mm -hmm. like there's there's no reason that it can't be right and i think mm -hmm. that there are just so many people who mm -hmm. feel so underrepresented in mm -hmm. Shakespeare, be they mm -hmm. be they uh, women, be they uh, non-binary, be they the, mm -hmm. our whole LGBTQ plus community, be they people mm -hmm. of color, be mm -hmm. they like, mm -hmm. the more people we can get represented on a Shakespeare stage, I think the better, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. And uh, yeah, and that goes for kind mm -hmm. of, this is, sorry, this is kind of a broader topic than just gender bending, but mm -hmm. yeah, that's kind of, that's always gonna be my answer for like, mm -hmm. can we use more people who are underrepresented in, in Shakespeare and like of yeah. course like yes. these are stories about yeah, yeah about love about like they're so universal that mm -hmm. there's just no reason that we we can't we can't represent those yeah. those communities and mm -hmm. especially now it's so mm -hmm. it's just so important mm -hmm. and uh yeah yeah so I guess that's my kind of feeling so yeah I want to I want to see a totally blown up gender wise mm -hmm. like let's yes. let's <laughs> get you know totally unconventional you know and the thing is mm -hmm. too that I saw about this production I was like why don't we have like a female doll or a female, you know, like there's mm -hmm, so many mm -hmm. roles that could be yes. so easily mm -hmm. um, gender swapped that, um, mm -hmm. yeah, I just, I think it's a service to all of us to, to really make the effort to, to make sure that, yeah, that underrepresented communities yeah. are represented on a Shakespeare stage. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. yeah, totally. Yeah. I think that this could be gender. Yeah. All over the place. Mm -hmm. just Beautiful. Throw, yeah. Love everyone it. in there. Yeah. Love yeah. It. More female fools. Now that you've said that. I would love to really? play a female fool, you know? Mm -hmm. That's another thing, too, just yeah. speaking, like, as a woman in theater, I think there's still this overwhelming, at the back of your mind, you kind of need to have a bit of etiquette, even if mm -hmm. you are playing a super comedic, clownish character, you're still a woman, and I, I think we need to break that a little bit, you know, that you can be wild and crazy and kooky mm -hmm. on stage, you know, just being being a woman um yeah and so 100 percent. i i would i would definitely play dull or or cost star to me yeah. those are the best characters to play <laughs> i saw yeah. a production of tempest where the two fools in what are their names again? Stefano Trinculo Trinculo Trinculo. 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 yeah we're, we're both women and it was great yeah like they just good. Good. it was yeah. just so good yeah mm -hmm. yeah very very cool yes. yeah mm. yeah yeah. Um, I, I, I wrote in my notes, you definitely can do this play non-gender, gender flipped, if you wanted to. Uh, you, you just have to make sure, like, once again, that, 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 that you're doing it properly. 
adjusting the text, doing your dramaturgical due diligence. I also think you want to make sure that if you are going to do that, you're going to make sure audiences don't come away trying to guess what you were trying to say. Yeah. Because uh, nowadays audiences love to read into like, well, why was that character gender strong? What are they trying to say? As theater people, we do that a lot. So mm -hmm. I, I think you've got to be cognizant of doing that because if you are going to swap it, then just do your due diligence there. And I also think one of the things we do have to adjust with our theater culture is if we are going to do these swaps is that, is that it doesn't become a marketing ploy where it's mm -hmm. like, oh, you got to come yeah. see yeah. Love's Labor's Lost with, with, with a, where, where, where it's bisexual couples or, 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 or trans or mm -hmm. whatever. Mm -hmm. Like John Kerr was very smart where he didn't advertise that, oh, this is a mixed race yeah. um, production. Like this was just a production of Love's Labor's and the fact that the only person you yeah. ever saw on the poster was Mike Shira writing his note and that was it. Like yeah. it, it was a nice surprise where the audience just, just didn't come in with a pre- thought of notion where it's like oh I'm going in because of this and this is now a marketing ploy. I do so I think, think yeah. however people mm -hmm. expect just colorblind casting from Stratford that is part mm -hmm. of the brand even mm -hmm. if like so while it wasn't advertised as a reason to see this show it is mm -hmm. just part of the Stratford culture that I think people would be very surprised if there was just an all-white production on a Stratford stage. Those do <laughs> yeah. exist. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I, Still? <laughs> well so, I well, think I mean, too like I've learned mm -hmm. a lot about recently like in the last like week or so between mm -hmm. performative allyship and like actually doing mm -hmm. something to mm -hmm. to help and i think that mm -hmm. yeah if you're if you're if you're casting like you know uh uh you know gender swapping or swapping mm -hmm. or whatever and mm -hmm. and making it this like oh, oh look at how good we're doing yeah. you know mm -hmm. look at it then that is obviously such a problem because it's yes. so performative exactly. yeah so i totally get mm -hmm. what you're saying mm -hmm. yeah. we're like yeah it shouldn't be a marketing tool it should exactly. just be how it is right exactly yeah. it, and that's my worry is, is that somebody would do it uh, as a marketing tool and i'm like well, yeah. that, well, well, well now you're not doing it right like the whole thing yeah. is that shakespeare yeah. is is a very open piece of piece of text where you can swap in certain characters and genders or things that sometimes some characters don't lend to that like there are some characters that are either very masculine or very feminine and like you have to kind of work with that but other times there are these plays that lend yourself to this wide array of different things like i would love to see a female fool like i was thinking that yeah. now I, 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 yeah. I was like bring on more of that like i would love to see somebody do that or, or like keep swapping like keep playing yeah. with it because Shakespeare lends itself to being a really well played with piece of text where you can kind of deep dive in and that's why Shakespeare keeps getting done in the world because yeah. He is a very open piece of text where you can have some fun in there. Sometimes it works. Sometimes the director just doesn't know exactly how to execute it and doesn't quite work, but it doesn't mean we shouldn't stop trying if something doesn't work the first time because I think yeah. there's lots of opportunities there. Do yeah. not overstate the obvious. Like all mm -hmm. of these characters were played by men and boys originally. So we're already doing, like Bridget talked yes. about yeah. this in the Knackers yeah. episode. Yeah. Uh, like it's already a bit of gender tampering to even just yes. have women on stage mm -hmm. playing these roles. So why yeah. can't we take that further? Exactly. Mm -hmm. Like I think Moth would be, could be a very easily played by, by, by a young female oh, actress. 100%. Oh, and you know what's yeah. funny too is it, that could almost be a second fool character if it Absolutely. was female. Because she, yeah. you know, she's, she's you smart. can have a side plot of, of maybe yes. she has a crush on Armada, you know, maybe she's not as young <laughs> as this mom yeah. was. Um, yeah. it, the whole scene where she's messing up, um, or she, I'm saying she, where Moth is messing up, mm -hmm. um, when the, the men are, are masked and they're playing right. the fights and and that could just be so funny you know yes. from a female's perspective mm -hmm. yeah um mm -hmm. the whole thing about jack and Etta, especially if she did have a crush on armada kind of right. like playing devil's advocate there of like, you, yeah. you know yeah. with the whole riddle sequence like they would mm -hmm. just be so cool to unpack yeah yeah yeah. For so for sure, and I think yeah. Overall, this play is one of those really neat kind of plays that leave leaves a door very wide open for mm -hmm. interpretations. I think that's why it needs to be done more, is because it's a play that lends itself to mm -hmm. doing that. Meanwhile, well, Mackers maybe not so much. Mackers is a very straightforward, very well set play. This is one because it's so mm -hmm. open. It's like go ahead and have fun with it. This 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 is one of your fun Shakespeare's. You can kind of can dive in and play and play in that sandbox a bit. But yeah, wonderful. Jill, yeah. where can people find you if, if they want to look you up? Yeah, so um, you can find me on Instagram. My artist account is Jillian.Robinson96. Mm -hmm. And I dabble in musicals and singing and mm -hmm. post fun other things. You'll find me there too. So, yeah. Very <laughs> good. Wonderful. Katie, where can people find you? 
Um, on Instagram, I am at Mercier Miller, which is my middle name. So it's M E R C I E R mm -hmm. Miller. Very yeah, good. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. And then Ryan, I know people can't you know find you answer. on social. <laughs> yes. I know. I, I've learned it by now. We, we can't find you, but please go follow Cup of Hemlock That's, at yes, all social media platforms instead. Yeah. <laughs> send the love to them. We're doing, there's a lot of great stuff coming up between our Cup episodes. We have a new series we just launched today, which is a Cup today of Hemlock that we're proudly filming, presents. Not today when yes. you watch this. Yes. Yes. <laughs> no, but, yes. no, by the time you're watching this, we will, we, will, we will be advertising for our next published reading. But yes, Which we've already started advertising in the last couple episodes, so there's no need to be secretive about it. It's very uh, true. We are doing a polished reading of Ibsen's Ghosts, and there maybe mm -hmm. we'll see some familiar faces from this show. Yes. In that. Um, also, but yes, check out our Merchant of Venice, which we did less polishedly, but yep. that is currently posted on this very YouTube channel where you're watching it is. this. Yeah, uh, you'll see. <laughs> <laughs> yeah there you go i love it okay and then all, oh, i'm sorry you can find me at all social media platforms at mackenzie horner check out my podcast before the downbeat and musical podcast we just released uh part one of our uh, musical oliver exploration and by the time this comes out part two will be out as well so do check those out lots of great stuff coming out on that front as well but other than that we'll see you all next time where we'll, we will be talking about, if I'm not mistaken, we are going into Denmark? We yes, we are. are. Something may be rotten in that state. <gasps> exactly. I got to say that line when I played Rosencrantz. Fun fact. There you go. <laughs> yeah. No, next time we're talking about Shakespeare's most produced, I want to say almost most popular play of his canon, the, 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 man, the man with the skull himself, alas, poor York. We are going into the realm of Hamlet. So be sure to tune in for that in the next episode. And then we have a whole bunch of other great things lined up. We have King John coming up. Pericles will be covering the newly released Othello and Merry Wives of Windsor later on. And then after we're done with our Shakespeare shut stuff, who knows where we're going? I know NT Live has a whole bunch of great bit of theater they are producing. So we may have to mm -hmm. go to that realm next. But for now, uh, have a great week, everybody. Stay healthy, stay safe. Raise a glass to all of you. Oh my goodness. Cheers. Cheers. Oh. Very good. Cheers. And we'll see you all next week uh, with Hamlet. Thanks, everybody, so much. Talk to you later. Bye. Bye.